In this lecture, we will discuss the latest portion of the classical Greek period, the latest mathematicians and philosophers that contributed to this classical Greek study of mathematics. And the first of them in our discussion is going to be Diophantus that lived in about 250 AD. He was interested in the theory of numbers to the extent that even his tomb reads like a mathematical puzzle that one can solve to figure out how old he actually was. Through art algebraic, the stone tells us how old he is. God gave him his boyhood one-sixth of his life, one-twelfth more as youth while whiskers grew rife, and so on. This is like a cute little problem that you can do, simply posed on somebody's grave, because they thought that mathematics was a elegant enough to be put on your tombstone, even for your afterlife. Arithmetica is Diophantus' biggest work, his major work. It consists of 13 books, and only six of them survived in the original Greek language. Four of them have been somewhat recently discovered in the Arabic version, and they were actually probably translations of Hypatia from around 400 AD, so about 150 years after Diophantus. Diophantus in Arithmetica has made a couple of particular innovations that make it quite special. First of all, he was the first Greek mathematician who recognized fractions as numbers and treated them as such. He developed symbolism. Recall that Euclid in his rhetoric is very verbose because there is no algebraic notation for things that he's trying to introduce. Diophantus was the first one to introduce any kind of algebraic notation, particularly for things like equations and powers. So this equation, for example, would be written this way in his Greek notation. The square was denoted this way, so for example, three squares, and so on, until we have an equation. Not only does this introduce a more concise way to write down an equation, it also then allows one to take advantage of more procedural steps, more algorithmic approach. For things like, you know, if you equate this to like 2x squared, in the modern notation, you can now see that you can do similar terms and so on. All of these manipulations become a lot easier to carry out. He was one of the first people to think about higher powers. So go beyond the squares and really introduce the cubes and the fourth and so on powers into the consideration and into the exploration. So introduce the idea of adequality. Think about the word adequate. When something is adequate, it's sort of good enough, close enough. At equality is an approximate equality. And this idea eventually at forma to find maxima of functions and tangent line to curves, because a tangent line to a curve is an approximation of a curve near the point of tangency, right? If I have a curve and I have a tangent line to it, near that point of tangency, we have at equality of the curve and the line. The line is approximately equal to the curve, and that's what allows us to explore calculus concepts such as maxima and minima. So let's take a look at a few examples from Arithmetica. First, we're going to take a look at Book 2, Proposition 8. Divide a given square into a sum of two squares. And this is the page from that book where this proposition rests, right here, Proposition 8. What does that mean in a modern language if we write it down using our notations? I will go through all of the arguments using our notation. Remember that Diophantus, of course, had his own, but I think that we will benefit from seeing his arithmetic and his algebraic techniques, but with our notation that we're used to. So in our terms, what we're seeing here is a square into a sum of two squares. So a squared equals b squared plus c squares. So what this proposition is actually looking for are Pythagorean triples. How does he go about achieving, finding, given a square, the sum of the two squares it equals to? First of all, he actually does his proofs sort of by example. So given a square, he picks a number, and in this particular case, he picks 16, and he wants to divide it into two squares. So one of them will be called x squared, and the other one will be called 16 minus x squared. Now, if I am to actually have 16, which is a square as a sum of two squares, I want this portion to be a square also. And this is where I'm going to focus my attention now. In the words of Diophantus, this is the next step. I form the square of the difference of an arbitrary multiple of x diminished by the root of 16, the chosen square. So diminished by 4. So he picks some arbitrary multiple of x, can be any number, 
and in this particular proof he picks 2, so arbitrary multiple of x diminished by 4, subtracted by 4. He makes that into a square, and then he equates it to this portion that needs to be a square in the first place. Okay? So again, arbitrary multiple of x diminished by 4, the square of this is set to be equal to the portion that we need to complete our Pythagorean triple here. Now, at this point, this is also where his notation um, proves useful because he can, just like we would today, open up the brackets and solve for x. I'm going to skip a couple of algebraic steps. We're going to end up with two roots, x equals 0, which he discards because it's not interesting, and an actual non-zero root. And that's the one we're going to work with. So we have that x is equal to 16 fifths. Now, remember, our Pythagorean triple will be... 16, so 4 squared, x squared, and something else squared. I'm using x equals 16 fifths, so now I need to compute the other two portions. x squared is obviously going to be a square because I'm squaring it, but it turns out that 16 minus x squared, because of how we set up this expression of something squared, will of course also end up being squared. So now I have my Pythagorean triple here. Square root of 16, which is Four, x, which is the number we solved for, and the square root of 16 minus x squared, which through our actual um, algorithm is guaranteed to be a square also. So if I plug in numbers that I got in this case, I'm going to get 4, x is 16 fifths, and then the square root of this number is 12 fifths. Now, if we take a look at this, this is not something that Pythagoreans would have been interested in because these are not whole numbers, they involve fractions. And again, Daphantus was one of the first to consider fractions as actual numbers. But if we actually factor out four-fifths, we get a Pythagorean integer triple as, you know, part of the answer. So all in all, we have a rational multiple of a Pythagorean triple. And this method is, of course, easily generalizable. Given any square, you can follow this through and obtain a Pythagorean triple or a rational multiple of Pythagorean triple this way. So the fact that he does it by example does not make the method inapplicable to other cases. You will be able to carry out this procedure for any square that you choose. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this process and see if we can notice anything else that lies underneath it. If we're talking about Pythagorean triple, after all, shouldn't we be able to see some kind of right angle triangle in this problem somewhere? So as I mentioned, this process can be applied to any particular square, so let's pick one so that we don't have scaling issues going on. So if a given square one is to be divided into sum of squares, I'm going to follow the process through exactly the same way. So remember that in the next step, we set this portion that needs to be a square to be equal to a arbitrary multiple of x diminished by the square root of our chosen square, so minus 1 squared. So this is the equation I now need to solve. And again, I'm going to skip a couple of algebraic steps, but we get two solutions. Again, 0, which will always be a solution, and some non-zero root here. What do we have in terms of the Pythagorean resulting Pythagorean triple then? So I have 1. I have x, and I have a square root of this number, which, again, if I plug this in and actually do some algebra, will turn out to be this particular number. This specific Pythagorean triple is also known as platonic sequence. So this was already also known in some contexts for some calculations. What we haven't seen yet is, once again, some kind of geometric relationship that this obviously has, given that we're talking about Pythagorean triples. So let's sketch this. Let's take a look at this equation and sketch portions of it. So I'm going to label this as my y, and so I will have y squared equals 2y squared. And I have two pieces that I need to then sketch. The y, that's the inside here. Notice that one part is y and one part is y squared. So this first portion, t is an arbitrary number, because this was an arbitrary multiple, so this is, of course, a line. It's a line of slope t and the y-intercept of negative 1. What about this one here? I have y squared equals 1 minus x squared. If I move x squares over to the side, I'm going to get x squared plus y squared equals 1, which is, of course, 
equation of a circle centered at the origin with radius 1. If these two, a line and the square, are to be set equal, the solution is the point of intersection. And this is then what I have. I already know what the solution has to be. I have my unit circle, I have my line, whose y-intercept is minus 1, so I know that this line looks like this, and then I know that the point of intersection has these coordinates. What I don't see quite yet is the actual right-angle triangle. Well, that's easy enough to introduce, right? There is one right here, a familiar right-angle triangle that we draw when we introduce, of course, trigonometric functions. This is a parametrization of sine and cosine functions. This is an underlying geometric nature of this entire process. Isn't that beautiful as an underlying geometric picture? I think it's quite elegant. What else is really interesting about this actual book and maybe about this particular page of the book is that this particular page is quite famous not for what was written by Diophantus on the page, but what was written by someone else in its margin. This is the margin in which Firma wrote his famous, this margin is too narrow to contain, last theorem. It is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes, or a fourth power into two fourth powers, or in general, any power higher than the second into two like powers. This process of separating a square into the sum of two squares is what resulted in Forma thinking about separating higher powers into the sum of the same two powers. This page is both rich in what was printed on it and what was not printed on it. Let's take a look at another proposition from Arithmetica. Book 1, Proposition 28. Find two numbers such that their sum and the sum of their squares are both given numbers. So once again, Defantis approaches it by example, showing his algorithm for a particular choice of numbers. In this case, he takes the sum to be 20 and the sum of squares to be 208. So now he needs to find two numbers, let's call them, I don't know, let's say x and y, so that their sum is 20 and the sum of their squares is 208. The method he applies is the method of so-called false position. Since the sum of the two numbers is to be 20, I'm going to take my two numbers, x and y, to be some number z away from 10 in both directions. So I notice that if I add these two together, then the sum is indeed is going to be 20. And now I only need to worry about the second condition, the fact that the sum of squares has to be 208. And I'm going to approach it in the most obvious way. Since the sum needs to be 208, I'm going to plug in these two values for x and y and work on that equation instead. The reason this equation is better is it only has one variable, z, whereas this one I couldn't solve for one of the variables fully, this one I actually can. If you expand it out, you notice too that this equation ends up having quite a lot of symmetry and so a lot of things actually cancel out. And in particular, what we are left with is only the quadratic parts. So we don't even have to solve quadratic equation. We have a very simple, the simplest form of the quadratic equation we can hope for. So he gets z as plus or minus 2 and he disregards the negative solution. If my z now is plus 2, I can figure out what my values for x and y are by simply plugging 2 into here. So in this particular case, I'm going to get that x is equal to 10 plus 2, so 12, and y is equal to 10 minus 2, so 8. The fact that Diophantus proceeded to show how to approach this problem through a particular choice of values is really not a detriment to the process, because this is easily generalizable. We simply take the a to be this number, some constant a, and b to be this number, and we can carry through the exact same calculations. So it's trivially generalizable to b of the form the sum is some constant, the sum of squares is another constant, and the general solution is produced by this method. Now, the interesting thing is the actual choice of the particular numbers, because he could have picked anything at all. So why 20 and why 208? And the really interesting part isn't really in the choice of original numbers, but rather in the choice of the answer.
Diophantus chooses the answer to his problems so that in this proposition, which is number 28, in the preceding one, and in two subsequent ones, the answers are all 12 and 8. A beautiful symmetry that is obviously not coincidental. What is really interesting, though, is that this is a Babylonian tradition of having the same answer in related problems. So the natural question arises, did Diophantus have some sort of access to the Babylonian materials and be inspired by this beautiful symmetry in the answers of related problems? And the method itself, the false position method, was used by ancient Egyptians. So did he have access to Egyptian materials and was inspired by the method of their false position that he then managed to lay out and generalize using his newly found more concise notation? Maybe, maybe not. One of the mysteries of mathematical history. While Diophantus was a Greek mathematician that developed arithmetica and algebra, Pappus, that lived in about 350 AD, is known as the last classical Greek geometer. Of course, we've seen a lot of ancient Greek geometry by now, and this is Pappus with his instruments of classical geometry. He was likely a teacher of mathematics, and much like Euclid, is not so much famous for his own discoveries, of which we will actually see one, but he is known for compiling known results into treatises. This was very important in the ancient times because this was something to be passed down, something to be used as a text, as a resource for future learning and future generations. This treatise synagogue, or the collection, is known to contain theorems, examples, supplementary results, alternative proofs. It's a very rich mathematical resource. Pappus actually opens his purely mathematical text with describing a natural phenomenon, talking about bees. Let's read through this. Bees then known just this fact, which is useful to them, that the hexagon is greater than the square and the triangle and will hold more honey for the same expenditure of material in constructing each. This is actually a fun first semester calculus problem to prove that hexagon is in fact, out of the other surfaces, the square and the triangle, the most optimal shape. So this uses the least amount of materials while enclosing the most amount of area. A famous honeycomb theorem was recently proven to show that hexagon is the last of the three regular polygons that can tile a surface. These then not only know calculus, but know mathematics in general, because they know that this is the optimal shape to construct their beehives in, using the least amount of material while making the most amount of volume and not creating any wasted space in between, for example, such as a circle packing wood, because circles can never lie flat against each other. But we, Pappas continues, claiming a greater share in wisdom than the bees, oh, how ignorant we are, will investigate a somewhat wider problem, namely that of all equilateral and equiangular plane figures having an equal perimeter, that which has the greater number of angles is always the greater, and the greatest of them is the circle having its perimeter equal to them. I want to pause here for a second and really think about this. I already commented on how ironic this is that he points out that we claim to share greater wisdom than the bees. In Western philosophy, and Western knowledge systems, humans are put on the top of the knowledge pyramid, so to speak. We are considered the most intellectual and sharing the most wisdom. In indigenous knowledge systems, humans are the newcomers. We are to learn something from our non-human people around us, from the trees, from the rocks that are much older, have been here much older, and therefore has co have collected much more wisdom and Pappas seems to point out exactly that. He opens a theoretical mathematical text talking about non-human people and how their knowledge can actually motivate our investigations into pure mathematics. Pappas also gives us two different approaches to a proof, analysis and synthesis, a forward and a backward direction. Pause here for a moment. Read through and think about different proofs that you have witnessed that would take one or the other approach. How were they the same? How were they different? 
Is one more suitable in some situation than others? One of Pappas' original results is the so-called Pappas' hexagon theorem. This is the statement, and it's a bit of a mouthful and the construction that is not necessarily very obvious or very clear. We have one set of collinear points, meaning they lie on one line, and another set of collinear points. We also will pair them up by lines connecting one from each set to the other, and the claim is the intersections of the new lines we create all lie on one line known as the Pappas line. Pause the video, try this construction for yourself. You probably will notice that you have to fiddle around with it a little bit so that it all fits on one page, but it really is a fun exercise. The other way to state the exact same result is the following. If the six vertices of a hexagon lie alternatively on two lines, then the three points of intersections of pairs of opposite sides are collinear. Let's try to follow this through. This is in fact why the theorem is called hexagon theorem. There's a hexagon hidden within this construction and this formulation uncovers it a little bit for us. So let's see, if I have two lines and I'm going to draw six edges of a hexagon lying alternatively with the vertices on each side. So here's one and I continue off to the other. And a third, notice that, of course, that I would like the opposite sides to actually intersect. So every other side has to intersect with the previous one. Whoops, and so on. So I will complete my hexagon. It is a closed polygon, so I have to go back to the point where I started from. And the claim here is that the points of intersections that I have created will, in fact, lie on a single line. And even with the naked eye, sort of, you can see here how that will in fact be true. Let me try to draw an actual straight line through them. Let's call it a win. This is what is called a Pappas line. This result is actually really deep because this is one of the foundational results in the so-called projective geometries. Yet another geometry that is not quite Euclidean because it assumes that every pair of parallel lines will eventually meet. Just like the railroad tracks, looking down the railroad tracks, we see that they meet at infinity. Projective geometry assumes that every single pair of lines will meet somewhere. Pappas' theorem is one of the foundational results that allows us to do algebra within that particular geometry. Hopefully this is something you see in the geometry course, and if not, we're going to talk a little bit more about it when we talk about Renaissance paintings and how the artists actually had to become familiar with projective paintings in order to make them realistic. last figure that we're going to discuss of this late Greek period is Hypatia, the only human woman in Raphael's School of Athens painting. Born around 335 AD, she was the first documented female scientist, highly respected in her time by her peers and highly respected after her time for her writings and for her teachings. She was born, as I already mentioned, around 335, and while this date is not exactly known to us, we know exactly that she was murdered in March 415. She was a daughter of Theon, another mathematician and editor of ancient text. She received a thorough education in math, astronomy, and philosophy. Her works included a lot of commentary on known texts, and a lot of our surviving texts, for example, Diophantus' Arithmetica, have examples that have been added by her and explanations that have been added to her and are probably one of the only reasons that those are their surviving texts because due to many additions, they are the ones that have been copied by future scribes and used as textbooks. She also commented quite a bit on Ptolemy's Almagest and was actually known as an astronomer. Many of the famous ancient philosophers whose writings we have to this day comment on Hypatia's great achievements of her time. There was a woman in Alexandria named Hypatia, says Socrates, who made such attainments in literature and science as to far surpass all of the philosophers of her own time. Having succeeded to the school of Plato and Plotinus, she explained the principles of philosophy to her auditors, 
many of whom came from a distance, in ancient times quite a feat, to receive her instructions. On account of her self-possession and ease of manner, which she has acquired as consequence of the cultivation of her mind, she not infrequently appeared in public in the presence of the magistrates. Neither did she feel abashed in going to an assembly of men. For all men, on account of her extraordinary dignity of virtue, admired her the more. This was the first time in history, the recorded history, that not only do we have a woman present in scientists in science, but also admitted to the science uh, community, although she was a woman, by purely being an actual mathematician, by being a great teacher and a great philosopher. Diakin, a more modern review, shares many of the same praises for Hypatia as did Socrates. The breadth of her interest is the most impressive. Within mathematics, she wrote and lectured on astronomy, geometry, and algebra, and made an advance in computational technique, all while engaging in religious philosophy and aspiring to a good writing style. This was particularly important in ancient times. Books were expensive, so you wanted a good product to be copied and used as textbooks in the future. Her writings, as best as we can judge, an outgrowth of her teaching in the technical areas of mathematics. In effect, she was continuing a program initiated by her father, a conscious effort to preserve the great mathematical works of the Alexandrian heritage. Unfortunately, it is due to the political turmoil and also her religious views that she was killed in a mob in the year 415. This really sent ripple waves through the philosophical community because philosophers were thought to be kind of untouchable. They were the advanced thinkers of the time. They were the ones that created the debates and they were people who were allowed to disagree with the king. Well, no more. This, in the end, put the end to the classical Greek period, to the great advances being made with the takeover of war and the dark ages coming soon to this area, Hypatia's death also put the end to the classical Greek mathematics.